arroba gmail, né? É isso mesmo. Só para... Sim. Pronto. Well, I hope Duncan, who I never met, will show off some of his Portuguese in his talk. We'll get it all done, so I won't have to worry about it. <laughs> My Portuguese is, uh, is non-existent, I'm afraid. Minimal. <laughs> <laughs> you could say that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll show my video for a little bit, but I have to finish my PowerPoint. So uh, I will be listening. Agnaldo, is he listening? Hi, Kelly. How are you doing? Are you? Good to see you. Sort of. Good to see you too. Professor Pritchard. Hi. Nice to see you. You too. Where are you now? Uh, you, me, I, I'm in, um, in in California, UC Irvine, so we're just south of LA. Oh, I see. What time is it now? It's uh, about 10 to 11 in the morning. Oh, I so see. Good time. <laughs> Perfect, actually. The kids are off. It's all nice and quiet here. Oh, the, problem with Zoom. the problem with Zoom, you know, I don't mind it. I can do it anytime. I've done some in the middle of the night, even. It's just you've got to know when the... There's no chaos in the background, you know? <laughs> got to yeah, for sure. When the family chaos isn't occurring. Yeah. I've got, I've got a pretty chaotic environment here at home, too. Yeah. Actually, Kelly, uh, have I told you, um, Miguel was born. No. no oh, May, May 20. Congratulations. Good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, send me some pictures in the chat. Yeah, we will. <laughs> we have someone new here. And um, I'm enjoying nightlife again. <laughs> Fabio, are you in there? You're enjoying not sleeping or? Uh, I'm yeah. sorry, everyone. Uh, Fab Fabio Bertato, are you there? Yes. I lost my connection. Uh, um, what should I do now? Sorry, everyone, we are having some technical issues. We, we start in a few minutes.
Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Fabio, we are hearing you. Okay. Yes, let's move on. Okay, thank you very much. Very welcome, everyone. I would like to say a few words about this institution promoted this event, as well as the project of which it is part. The Center for Logic, Epistemology and the History of Science, CLE, or as we call it, CLE, of the University of Campinas, Unicamp, exists since 1977. CLE is the first interdisciplinary research center at Unicamp and the first academic institution in, this area, in the areas of logic, epistemology, and history of science, created in Brazil and possibly throughout Latin America, aiming to bring it together scholars from the various branches of scientific and philosophical knowledge. It counts currently with more than 100 members, consisting of professors and researchers from various institutes of UNICAM and other Brazilian and foreign universities. CLEAR has promoted more than 100 medium and large size events, in addition to several conferences, lectures, and courses. Around, around 500 renowned researchers have visited CLEAR, promoting teaching and research activities. CLEAR researchers have developed important logical tools, among which are paraconsistent, paraconsistent logics from a known dialect theistic perspective with great application power. We believe that among such application is the area of philosophy of religion. The conference, New Perspectives in Philosophy of Religion, is part of the formal approaches to philosophy of religion and analytic theology. A project, a three years pro project funded by the John Templeton Foundation. The big questions underlying this project are, how can the formal logic methods help us to understand and deep the metaphysical and theological truths? How and to which extent the conceptual framework provided by new scholasticism can help us to address several interdependent problems and philosophy of religion, analytic theology, formal metaphysics and formal epistemology? To address these big questions, the purpose is to provide discussions and formal systems to answer questions concerning the, the existence of God, the rationality of the Trinity, the problem of evil, formal metaphysics, and so on. The project aims to establish an interdisciplinary network of scholars interested in philosophy of religion, analytic theology, and formal logic. It began training a young generation of Latin American researchers. In the coming months, we must publicize a concrete initiative to create a specific email list on philosophy of religion. I hope you can particularly help us, you can uh, help us with this goal. We are organizing a special volume of the journal Manuscrito on analytic philosophy of religion. We are also editing a book by the Clay Collection on themes in philosophy of religion and a handbook on analytic philosophy of religion in Portuguese. We have organized a summer course and a winter course on the logic of religion, an introduction to the philosophy of religion. This conference is an important part of this entire initiative. Therefore, we thank you all the speakers and all the participants. I hope you have a very nice experience at, at this event and that soon we can meet in person here in Brazil. Now, I'd like to turn the floor over to Nicola Salvatore, who is the chair of this first session. Thank you all and welcome again. Please, Nicola. Nicola, your mic is muted. Your microphone, your microphone, Nicola. 
Could you please? I was talking already. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio, and thanks to all the person invited. So it's with great pleasure that I invite uh, that we've invited Professor uh, Duncan Preacher. So Duncan Preacher is a, a distinguished professor of philosophy at the University of California, Irvine. He has also held the uh, uh, teaching position at the University of Edinburgh when I had the opportunity to work with him. So it's great to see him here. Uh, Professor Pritchard works mainly in epistemology, especially with uh, on the problem of skepticism, Wittgenstein, uh, the third Wittgenstein uncertainty, philosophy of cognitive science, philosophy of religion, philosophy of education, and philosophy of uh, uh, law. Yeah, he has had shares in epistemology at the University of Edinburgh and the University of Stirling, Scotland. He has also held visiting positions at the University of Connecticut, Stores, Macquarie University, the University of Helsinki, and Arius University in Denmark. Among his various monographs, I have notes here because he published extensively in the area, uh, his monographs include uh, Epistemic Luck, The Nature and Value, uh, value of Knowledge, epistemological disjunctivism and epistemic angst, radical skepticism and the groundlessness of our believing. His most uh, recent book is Skepticism, a very short introduction. And thank you very much for being here. Please welcome Duncan Pritchard. Thank you for being here. Thanks very much, Nicola. And uh, thanks very much to uh, Nicola and Fabio for inviting me. Um, can, I, um, can I just share my screen? Is that... Um... Can I do that? Let's have a look. Oh, yep, I can. Yes, I can. Okay, so I'll share my screen and then, uh, and I think what I'll do as well is um, when it gets to the discussion, I'll, I'll send you the. Hang on, no, that's not what I meant to do. Sorry. Uh, okay, that's what I meant to do. When it gets to the discussion, I'll, I'll also send you the PDFs as well. I'll put them in the chat. So, PDF, the PowerPoint, so you, you have a copy. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is uh, quasi-fideism. Uh, this is um, a position that um, I've argued is the, the right way to read uh, Vic, later Wittgenstein, the very late Wittgenstein, what Nicola just said, the third Wittgenstein, so this, uh, the idea that there's a distinctive kind of, uh, stance that Wittgenstein takes in his final notebooks, which were published as uh, uncertainty, and I, I think I, I would agree with that. Um, the stance Wittgenstein takes there, as we'll see, is, uh, is very interesting. He, he advocates what's called these days a hinge epistemology. I have a particular reading of what's going on in uncertainty. I think that one of the big stimuli for uncertainty for those notebooks is, in fact, John Henry Newman, and in particular, Newman's essay in Aid of a Grammar of Ascent. And Newman's concerns in that work are specifically religious. He's responding to a kind of Lockean evidentialism and also human skepticism about religious belief as well. Um, and I think that the, the sort of view that Newman is setting out there is essentially a hinge epistemology. And I think Wittgenstein, who was very aware of Newman's work, uh, was very influenced by it. And I think he's what well, he's doing in uncertainty, he's seeing the connections between what Newman's talking about and what Moore's talking about. And in fact, the connections are pretty clear. Moore talks about these everyday certainties. Newman also is talking about these everyday certainties. It could even be that Moore gets them from Newman. In fact, interestingly, lots of people at that time were talking about these everyday certainties and their special role they play. I mean, we think of Moore as being unique here, but he, but he wasn't. So I think there's this position quasi-fideism, which I think captures what Wittgenstein's up to in uncertainty. And, um, and if that's right, then it means that Wittgenstein isn't a straight fideist. So Wittgenstein is normally thought of as a straight fideist, and with, with good reason, because of the, um, the, the remarks that were published um, uh, as Wittgenstein's lectures and conversations on aesthetic psychology and religious belief that came out in the mid 60s. Um, he does seem, and in other places too, he does seem to be a straight fideist, but it seems by the time we get to uncertainty, there's this different position, this Newman influence position starts to come to the fore. So I've been trying to articulate what that view is. I mean, at the very least, it seems to me that it's a position as regards the rationality of religious belief that, that ought to be in the mix, right? You know, we have the sort of the taxonomy of views the sort of the topography of positions that are available. And there's a big gap where quasi fideism it seems to me, should be. So here's the structure of the talk. I'm going to say a bit about Wittgenstein Hinge Commitments, because that's the background to this. I'm going to talk about quasi-fideism and outline. As we'll see, it's basically the application of Hinge epistemology to the religious case. 
Uh, and then I'm going to talk about its rivals, and I'm going to talk about some uh, objections to the view. Uh, I, I first articulated quasi fideismus position about just over a decade ago. So we, there's now been a bunch of uh, papers and uh, even a book attacking it. So that's quite useful because it means I've got something now to get my, my teeth into. I'm, I'm not going to get into who said what when because that, that takes time. I'll just come up with what I think are the main objections and, and, and talk about them. Okay, so let's talk about Wittgenstein on Hinge commitments. Here's the, the main features of the view. Wittgenstein is arguing, like Newman before him actually, that all rational evaluation takes place relative to this backdrop of certainty. So the certainty has to be in place in order for rational evaluation to occur. And this certainty is manifested in certain everyday common sense commitments, these Morian commitments. Things like I've never been to the moon, I've got two hands, uh, my name is Duncan Pritchard, I'm speaking English, and so on. These are the, the hinge commitments, as they're known as a famous passage in uncertainty. So it's the certainty that has to be in place in order for, as it were, the door of rational evaluation to occur. And one consequence of this picture is that those hinge certainties themselves cannot be rationally evaluated. The certainty has to be in place in order for rational evaluation to occur. That means that the hinges are not themselves rationally valuable. And this is a very radical picture. Uh, one immediate consequence of the view is that rational evaluation is then an essentially local activity. The very idea of a fully general rational evaluation is simply incoherent. And notice I say here whether positive or negative. So the radical skeptic wants to do a fully general rational evaluation of our commitments and find them wanting, right? That's the negative side of this. But equally traditional anti-skepticism wants to do the opposite. It wants to rationally evaluate our beliefs all at once and find them in good order. And the Wittgensteinian view in uncertainty is that this is simply incoherent. The very project is incoherent. It's a, mis it's a mistaken conception of what rational evaluation is. So in terms of the positive project, I mean, just think about Descartes and the meditations and he has this wonderful metaphor of the, uh, the basket of apples, you know, that's our beliefs. And we shouldn't evaluate them piecemeal, we should tip, tip them all out at once, right? And then only let them back in once we're, we're, we're satisfied with them. You know, this is, you know, a, a sort of paradigmatic, fully general rational evaluation. They can sign saying that it might seem like we can do that kind of thing. Once we look more closely at our practice, we realize that we can't. Our hinge commitments are non-optional make no sense of a subject, a rational subject that lacks them. I mean, Wittgenstein says again and again, um, it, it's, he's making a claim about logic, right? So it's not a contingent fact about us that we have hinge commitments. It's a contingent fact, maybe which hinge commitments we have, how that certainty is manifested itself. But that there has to be certainty in play, he thinks is, is, is a logical claim. So it's in the very nature of rational evaluation it'd be like this. It's not as if, if only we were more, uh, uh, if we only if we were cleverer or you know more conscientious or something like that, or if we things practices had just evolved differently, we could have dis discharged these um, these hinge commitments. That's not possible. I mean, related to this, he says to him again, they're, they're not assumptions, they're not hypotheses, right? The assumptions and hypotheses can be discharged. The hinge commitments aren't like that, they don't play that role. Nonetheless, even despite all of that, the thought is that our non-hinge beliefs. Right. that their, their rational standing is bona fide. There's one thought you might, you might have here is, well, look, well, surely does it, doesn't that call all of our rational support into to question? But this is the sort of anti-skeptical element to this. Um, you know, this isn't meant to be skepticism in a, a different form. This is actually, or so I've argued, it's meant to be the antidote to skepticism. So finding our way out of the skeptical problem, or at least one version of it, uh, involves recognizing that there's this faulty picture in play, a picture on which we can fully general, do fully general rational evaluations. Now, what I've just said about um, hinge commitments, that's pretty much, as far as anything you say about Wittgenstein is uncontentious, that's fairly uncontentious. Let me say a little bit more about how I, the distinctive features of my own take on hinge commitments. And it, this is important because this explains how I'm thinking of quasi-fideism the application of hinge epistemology to the religious case. So I think a lot of views, hinge epistemology views are, are basically domestications of what Wittgenstein was saying. So rather than take, what Wittgenstein's saying is very radical, rather than take that at face value, they, people try and find ways to sort of 
um, get, get Wittgenstein to be a little less radical, a little more in keeping with our contemporary mores. I, uh, I, I take a different line. I, I think we should take Wittgenstein at face value. I think that the, the key to the power of the, the proposal lies precisely in its radical nature. And that when you domesticate it, you deprive it of that power. So I want to take seriously, for example, what Wittgenstein says about the distinctive nature of these, these propositional attitudes. It's animal, it's visceral, it's there like our life. Uh, they're not directly acquired by rational processes. He says, we, we, we swallow down, this is his expression, we swallow down our hinge commitments uh, it, along with other things that we're taught. We're not taught that we've got hands. We're taught to do things with our hands. You know? It's part of a world picture that's in the background and which we sort of absorb, uh, with, you know, unthinkingly absorb. Our hinge commitments aren't directly responsive to rational considerations either. They are indirectly. I'll explain what I mean by that. They're just not directly. They're not, we don't give reasons for and against them, or at least our commitments aren't affected by reasons for and against them. They're not grounded in reasons. They're not the kind of commitment they are. Wittgenstein, I think, is very clear about this. Now, one point I've tried to make to capture the radical nature of the proposal here is to say that our hinge commitments, in, a, in one sense, are not beliefs. Now, I have to be very careful here. In the folk sense of belief, so there's a folk sense of belief, which is, I think is very broad and very inclusive, just about anything, can, any, any kind of endorsement of a proposition counts as a belief in the folk sense. Um, so a lot of the distinctions we make as philosophers between you know, beliefs and, and acceptances, for example, I, I think they both count as beliefs in the, in the folk sense. And, and this goes for a lot of propositional attitudes in play here. So in the folk sense, they are beliefs. I'm not denying that. But I think there's a more specific sense of belief that's of interest to epistemology. And this is the, the notion of belief, which is, as I say here, the prop that propositional attitude that's a constituent part of rationally grounded knowledge. I think that propositional attitude has some, some particular features that the folk notion doesn't necessarily have. Uh, and I want to focus on one feature in particular, which is this, that, you know, that, that notion of belief, so when, when epistemologists talk about the telos of belief and so on, we can only make sense of those debates if we're thinking of this as a believing to be true in the following sense, uh, that insofar as your, uh, let's call it chaotic believing in this more narrow sense, insofar as your chaotic believing that P, that's inconsistent with you recognizing you have no rational basis for thinking P is true, right? You can't, at the same time, chaos believe that p and recognize you've got no rational basis for p being true of course you can you can chaos believe p and have no rational basis but it's not the, it's not the lack of rational basis the problem it's the recognition you have no rational basis of the problem if you carry on chaos believing or chaos having a commitment afterwards then whatever that is it's a different kind of propositional attitude because of course the chaos believing is believing it to be true now that's significant for our purposes because one of the things that Wittgenstein says about hinge commitments, and I want to take seriously, is that they're precisely the kind of commitments that would we would continue to have to the same degree, even once we recognize we have no rational basis. They're not responsive to reasons in that way. And if that's right, then they're not chaotic believings. And I think that's an important point. And I think we it's important to, to, to differentiate our hinge commitments and the kind of propositional attitude it is from a chaotic believing. It, it plays a different kind of role. And I think one of the themes of uncertainty is trying to get us to see the very special role it plays. I actually think that um, hinge, our hinge commitments are, it's a sui generis. So I don't think there's, a, there's an existing propositional attitude that really fits the bills. So it's not like we can take one off the peg and say, ah, oh, hinge commitments are like that. And that means that, I mean, we can explain what its role is, uh, but it also means that primarily the best way to explain it is negatively. Um, so this is what I do in my book, Epistemic Angst. I say, I explain why it's not an acceptance, why it's not a chaotic believing, why it's not an alif in the Gendler sense, um, why it's not a trusting, why it's not an hypothesis and so on. So there's lots of propositional attitudes in the vicinity and it's none of those. It has very special kind of properties. I won't get into this today, but one, of, one advantage uh, of thinking about our hinge commitments this way is that um, it helps us deal with an issue raised by closure. I mean, basically, if you know the debate, the idea is you don't have to deny closure on this view. The Wittgensteinian line, uh, you can undercut the skeptical problem with closure in play, because closure is, is precisely a principle properly understood about the extension of, of rationally grounded belief in the k sense. So the hinge commitments are simply inapplicable to closure inferences. Uh, one more thing I wanna say about hinge commitments before we get on to uh, quasi-fideism. 
and this is a, a, a feature only of my view, but it's relevant. So lots of views about uh, hinge hinges, they, they emphasize the variability of our hinge commitments. Yeah, because on the face of it, they look like a heterogeneous class. You know, they're variable to in terms of person, place, culture, epoch, and so on. You know, I am Duncan Pritchard is a hinge commitment for me. Obviously, it's not for you. Uh, you're 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 plugging your name to get your hinge commitment there. You know, I'm speaking English. Someone else could be I'm speaking Portuguese, and so on. Um, and so you know, it's a hinge commitment for me that I've never been to the moon like it was for for more. But I I would imagine there's going to be a, a future generations for which this won't be a hinge commitment, and so on. Um, I see that billionaires are already off into space. This is already beginning to occur. But I, I, I think it's wrong to think that actually that they're heterogeneous as a class. I think if you look a bit more closely, they're, they're, they're actually very homogenous. Um, and in fact, they have a common core. So this is a feature of my view. I think there's a, an overall, I mean, I think this is actually Wittgenstein's view. What's in play is this primitive certainty, this a general overarching certainty that needs to be in play, and which is then manifested in a commitment to particular propositions. But it's not the commitment to particular propositions that's really doing the work here. It's this is this underlying overarching certainty. And what is that? I think it's the I call it the Uber hinge commitment. It's a commitment to not being radically and fundamentally mistaken. And I so I think the way you get so there's that general, and I'm not saying you have an occurrent thought. And in fact, you, you may not have a current thoughts about any of your hinge commitments, right? As Wittgenstein says, they're hidden. They, um, uh, they, lie, uh, they, they, they don't lie on the route traveled by inquiry. And in a certain sense, they're hidden from view or the, in plain view, but they're, they're kind of obscured. They're so every day that we're not aware of them. So you might not have any thoughts about them, but the point is it's, it's, it's manifest in our actions that we have this certainty in play. And then the idea is you've got this certainty in play, you've got your set of K-out beliefs, and then that generates specific hinge commitments. So this can explain why, for example, the very same proposition in one context could be a hinge commitment and not another. So, you know, for most of us, I take it, I have two hands is a hinge commitment. It's not something grounded in reasons. We might think that it is, but it isn't. And Wittgenstein makes this very clear to us. Um, but if I were to, 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 to wake up, you know, after a, a serious car accident in hospital, it, this could become a hinge commitment. This could become a normal belief, right? I mean, it would make, in normal circumstances, it makes no sense to think to yourself, you know, do I have hands? And think, oh, yes, there they are. <laughs> you know, so I could say, Duncan, do you have your keys? And I could tap my pockets, go, oh, yes, there they are. Duncan, have you got two hands? Uh, oh, yes, there they are. Makes no sense. But, but there are contexts in which that would make sense. You know, you, you awake, confused in a hospital bed. You think to yourself, do I have my hands still? And then, oh, there they are, right? That makes sense. Now it's, it's a different kind of commitment. But of course, we can explain what's going on here. It's um, uh, in terms of the Uber hinge commitment. It's like your, your set of chaotic beliefs has changed. And so what manifests that, that underlying certainty is, is different now. I think it can also ex explain why our hinge commitments can change over time. I mentioned it having never been to the moon. Hinge commitment for more. I think it's a hinge commitment for us. But, you know, at some point, uh, I think it will cease to be a hinge commitment. Whether or not you've been to the moon will be like whether or not you've been to, I mean, in my case, whether or not I've been to Norwich, which is a town in the east of England. I'm pretty sure I've never been there. But it's not, it's not a hinge commitment. It wouldn't, it wouldn't rock my world if it turned out I'd been to Norwich. Uh, but what's, you know, my beliefs are changing. And so... There's a, it's as it were, there's a functional role between the Uber hinge commitment, the set of my chaotic beliefs, and which specific contents manifest that Uber hinge commitment. So this explains why in rational ways our hinge commitments can change. Uh, not directly, they're not directly responsive to reasons, but they're indirectly responsive to reasons because as your chaotic beliefs change, then what manifests the Uber hinge can change. Okay, with all that in mind, let's get to... Um, Quasi fides. Now, I'm not, you'll notice I haven't tried to defend hinge epistemology today. That's a different talk. Just told you what it is. Um, and, I, and I won't be defending it. Um, what I, I I've just told you about it just so that you can see how it might apply in the religious case, right? And that this, there's not that much discussion in uncertainty about this. There's some remarks here and there. But as I say, I think if you think, if you take seriously what, I, what I've said about um, Wittgenstein getting this idea from Newman, then the connection, I think, is very straightforward. Our fundamental religious commitments, so hinge commitments, so the idea is a rational. That's the fideistic element to this. But the idea is that that's compatible uh, with one's general religious commitments, being chaotic beliefs in the normal way. 
just as one's, you know, in the normal sense, one's normal beliefs can presuppose a rational commitment. So one's religious beliefs can, can presuppose a rational commitment. So this is the quasi element to it. It's not full fideism. And in fact, it's very different to fideism because there's no ghettoization going on here. We're not saying that um, a religious belief has to be evaluated differently to everyday belief, quite the opposite. Religious belief structurally is just like everyday belief. Everyday belief has a rational commitment to its heart. So does religious belief. Right. Uh, we could also make similar moves about closure. I'm, I'm not going to get into that just to save time. So let me just say um, uh, some of the advantages of the view. I mean, I've, I've mentioned a little bit of this already. I mean, we can we can tread a course between the epistemic heroism of Locke and evidentialism. Say a bit more. So, so as, you, as I'm sure you're familiar, um, Locke and evidentialism puts this very austere demand, or ends up putting this very austere evidential demand on religious belief. I mean, I'm thinking of, of, of Locke's remarks on the the enthusiasts here in his essay concerning human understanding. Um, and, and, and as people have pointed out, come back to this, that it seems like we, we end up imposing a more austere evidential demand on religious belief than would on everyday belief. That's why I call it epistemic heroism. But it also avoids what I've just called the epistemic ghettoization of traditional fideism. We, we're not saying that religious belief has to be evaluated in a different way to everyday belief, which is the usual fideistic line. We get a principled response to skepticism about the epistemic standing of religious belief via a parity argument. I'll explain that in a minute. And I think it's faithful as well to the distinctive features of at least a certain kind of basic religious conviction. I suspect this is fundamentally what religious conviction is, but I, I make no, that this is kind of an empirical claim, so it's not for me to make. But I think at least there's a certain kind of religious conviction that has this, this nature. It's phenomenology, it's fulcrum role in our practices, unusual relationship to reasons. I have Shizaku Endo here. I don't know if you recognize this gentleman. Um, quasi fideism might not have been represented in philosophy, but I think it is represented quite nicely in literature. Um, Endo's works, uh, you could cast these people as fideists, but I think equally you could cast them as quasi fideists. I, I think more plausibly as quasi fideists, or, or at least they're articulating a quasi fideistic way of life. Graham Greene springs to mind here as well. Anthony Burgess is another one. So I think the contrast with, with evidentialism and fideism is, is, is fairly clear. I won't labor that point. Um, let me say a little bit about reformed epistemology because I think this is where the, the contrast is maybe more, uh, more interesting. Uh, easily, we might easily confuse the two views. They, they have some superficial similarities. So reformed epistemology is defended by Plantinga on the, on the PowerPoint here. This is the idea that basic religious beliefs, they don't need the independent evidential support of the Lockean demands because they can no, be known in virtue of a certain externalist story, externalist epistemic support. So uh, we, we, we the, essentially it goes via um, an appeal to a religious faculty, sensitive in you know, so you have this Calvinistic idea insofar as that faculty is working appropriately in the right kind of conditions and so forth, it can generate basic religious beliefs. And so we can explain how these basic beliefs can amount to knowledge, even if they don't meet an evidential standard. What's interesting for our purposes is that reformed epistemology employs a parity argument. So uh, it says, look, you know, you, we can't criticize religious belief for telling this externalist story uh, because that's how we defend everyday belief, right? So take the perceptual case. Do we have um, independent evidential support for our basic perceptual beliefs? Well, no, we don't. So how do we explain perceptual knowledge? Well, we have an externalist story, a faculty-based story to tell about basic religious, uh, basic perceptual belief. But the thought goes, if you can tell that story there, well, why can't you tell that story in the religious case, right? I mean, if, if we can appeal to faculties to, to understand basic perceptual belief, why can't we appeal to religious faculties to explain basic religious belief? quasi fideism also has a parity argument, but it's, it's kind of like an inverted form of it. So, and, and by the way, John Henry Newman in his essay, Native Grand Percent, he very clearly states this parity argument um, at a number of junctures. The thought goes, look, you know, we criticize religious belief because it has these irrational commitments at its heart, but all belief has a rational commitment at its heart when we look closely. So this can't possibly be a reason to be skeptical about the rationality of religious belief. All right, so again, parity. Notice the difference though. Reformed epistemology is all about explaining how contrary to appearances, we do have religious knowledge, but the basic kind of our basic religious commitments. Quasi-fideism goes the other way. 
we don't have uh, basic knowledge of our basic religious commitments, but that's okay because we don't have, you know, have our most basic commitments in, in ordinary life aren't known either, right? So that, that can't be a charge against um, religious belief. Okay. Right, I want to now move on to some uh, objections to the view. Um, some of the objections uh, rest on, I think, misunderstandings. Um, some issues people raise are really about scope, you know, that um, people, so, and we'll look at this all crop up again, actually, here and there. Um, some of say, well, you know, religious belief just isn't like that. Uh, it's not like how the quasi it, it, it describes it. And well, that may be true. I mean, you know, ultimately that's an empirical claim and the view is hostage to that. It seems very plausible to me. Um, but, and, and, and certainly it's possible that maybe the kind of conviction that the quasi fidius sketches is not as widespread as the quasi fidius claims. I mean, that's a possibility. Uh, and if that's right, well, that would be a problem for the view. But um, so it can be granted that there might be kinds of conviction which aren't like this. And then of course, quasi fidiasm wouldn't apply. I mean, to give you an example, I know people who have, who well, at least they say they, they, they believe they have religious conviction, but it's grounded in, for example, reflecting on fine tuning considerations. If, that, if that's the basis of your religious conviction, then obviously quasi fideism is of no use, right? It's a normal chaotic belief, um, but that's fine, right? I mean, then it's just it's simply inapplicable. I think it would be important to the view that it has at least some wide application, but it doesn't have to be a universal application. Another kind of confusion relates to the non-belief point. So, I mean, Jerome Derrida has a paper and he makes a lot of this. He says, well, you know, on Pritchard's view, the quasi-fidious view, religious conviction, it's not, it's not a belief. So these people don't believe it. Surely they think they believe it. They say they believe it. Isn't, is this, doesn't this imply a kind of incoherence on their part, right? But of course, uh, this is a misunderstanding. Of course, they believe it in the folk sense. I'm not saying they believe it. They do believe it in the folk sense. So there's no incoherence on their part. When they say they believe it, that's that's fine. It's in a technical sense they don't believe it. And um, so there's no the folk descriptions don't imply any kind of self deceit. There is a deeper point here though, uh, which I want to say more about on the self deceit point. So forget about the belief. And the belief point doesn't really get a grip. But you might think, and this goes back to the issue of scope. You might think, well, lots of religious believers certainly think they have good rational grounds, right? Uh, Derrida, again, makes this point about natural theology. You know, there's this whole project of giving grounds, right? So how are we to make sense of what's going on there if you're a quasi fidius Do we have to attribute a large dose of, of, of self-deceit to them? Um, well, one issue here is scope, right? I mean, it may be that there's some kinds of religious conviction that aren't best understood along quasi fidius lines. So if you, you know, if you're that guy who believes in God because of fine tuning considerations and obviously quasi fideism is not of any help to you. But I think we should also look a bit more closely at what's going on when people talk about their religious conviction being rationally grounded, because I'm not sure we can take it at face value. I mean, after all, Wittgenstein's right. I mean, think about, how, I mean, hands, right? You know, I, I have two hands. We might antecedently, I mean, the thought goes, we don't normally even consider these things, right? But insofar as we consider them, I think, well, I've got lots of reasons, haven't I? Um, but what Wittgenstein tries to get us, you know, I can see them, I can feel them, whatever. but as Wittgenstein tries to get us to see that those reasons are kind of, they're not playing any, any, any basing role, you know, your conviction, your certainty is not in any sense based on them in the way it might, you know, in the normal chaotic belief, it could be based on reasons. This is one of the points that if these examples try and get us to see that. And I think something similar is going on in the religious case. I mean, a proponent of natural theology. I mean, do they take their religious convictions to be provisional while they're gathering evidence? Would they? Do we think that they would just simply change their mind if the evidence wasn't forthcoming? It seems that that whatever what's going on here is kind of it floats free, as it were, from the actual commitment, the nature of the commitment, and what it's grounded in. Uh, I mean, it, fundamentally, it seems to me the issue is one of basing. You know, even if there's a whole a story to be told about reasons, what grounds the conviction isn't the reasons. The reasons are playing a different kind of role. So that would be compatible with um, uh, quasi fideism. I mean, one way to put this, I suppose, is to say, I mean, self-deceit looks sounds a bit strong to me. It's like on this view, what we would have is kind of like an incomplete self-understanding or something like that. 
But I don't think that's particular. I'm not sure this, even the self deceit is that problematic. But the idea that we have some incomplete self understanding, I think, sounds rather plausible to me. It doesn't sound like a reductio of the view if it has that consequence. Another problem is abominable conjunction. You've never seen an abominable conjunction. I managed to take a photo of one. It's on the PowerPoint there. So abominable conjunctions, if you do mainstream epistemology, you'll be familiar with this objection. It crops up elsewhere. It was DeRose that first formulated it. But you can apply it to the quasi fides case, or so it seems. Because the thought goes, well, aren't they committed to abominable conjunctions of the following form? I know that, insert some specific religious claim which entails God existence, uh, but not that God exists. Where God exists, let's say, is, is the, one of the fundamental hinge commitments. And it's true that um, quasi fides and fides would have some kind of commitments along those lines. Whether this is abominable, though, really, it depends <laughs> quite strongly on whether there'd be any reason for someone to actually boldly state such a conjunction. I just don't see why anyone would. Um, I could see why someone might uh, assert such a conjunction in, with a qualification or with an explanation. That would make sense. Um, you know, someone might say, well, you know, I, I have a view, and on my view, I think you can, certain kinds of religious claims are in the market for knowledge, and other kinds aren't, and here's why, and here's other related, whatever. Um, but if you add that kind of explanation, then there's nothing abominable about it. it it's the, the puzzle, as it were, is removed. The puzzle is only there because you just simply boldly state it. But I don't, you, but <laughs> why would you do such a thing? Related to this, I think we, we have to remove, at the very least, you'd have to remove some implications here. So, you know, if you say that you don't know, so like you don't know that God exists or whatever, that would at least imply, I think, that you weren't, it would imply that you're uncertain of it in some way, probably imply that you doubt it, uh, which is a slightly stronger claim. But of course, on this view, you are certain of it. So, yeah, this would be a very misleading claim to make. So it would, it would demand qualification. In any case, it seems to me the abominable conjunctions aren't abominable once they're explained, and any reasonable person would explain them. They wouldn't just simply boldly assert them. A deeper issue is epistemic relativism. Um, this is a problem that afflicts hinge epistemology has been held to afflict hinge epistemology, but which you might think is, is it, 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 it appears in a, in a sharper form when you have quasi fideism on the table. The basic idea is, look, if you, if you think that um, the very system of rational evaluation is hinge relative and that we can have distinct sets of hinge commitments, right? We can have different hinge commitments, then that seems to imply epistemic relativism. And uh, the, the bringing in quasi fideism seems to take, give this um, uh, make this problem more pointed because, of course, um, obviously we don't all share religious hinge commitments, right? So it's it gives it makes vivid this idea that uh, hinge commitments might not be universal. I think we need to differentiate here between a, a strong and a weak form of epistemic relativism, though. What follows from the fact that um, there can be distinct sets of hinge commitments is that there, there can be distinct epistemic systems. That's the weak claim. That's definitely true. So in that weak sense, epistemic relativism follows. But the real worry about epistemic relativism isn't, isn't merely the idea of distinct epistemic systems. It's, it's the idea that can be incommensurable uh, epistemic systems, i.e. epistemic systems that are so different in their fundamental commitments that uh, disagreements, even in principle, can't be rationally resolved. All right, that's the real worry. Then you've got like two systems which are just can't engage with one another, rationally speaking. But why would that follow? Um, you know, that, that there are distinct hinge commitments is compatible with there being lots of overlaps in one's hinge commitments. There could be lots of overlaps in the epistemic systems. So we don't get the incommensurability claim just by simply conceding that there can be distinct epistemic systems. So that's one way of dealing with the epistemic relativism. It's the, the line I take. Um, Moreover, on, on, uh, on my view, if you recall the way I, I set it out, um, um, I emphasize the, uh, the universal nature of our hinge commitments. So there's, there's accounts of hinge commitments that emphasize the heterogeneous nature of our hinge commitments. And there are accounts like mine that emphasize their homogeneous nature. And I think that's the, if you go down that route, then I think you have an easier time with epistemic relativism. R related to this, by the way, a little exegetical point, um, the hinge metaphor is the one that stuck, right? Wittgenstein uses, lot, uses lots of metaphors, yes. But, and the hinge metaphor is perfectly good for what he wants to do. Something has to hold fast for something else to occur. But the hinge metaphor has a kind of unfortunate implication, which I think Wittgenstein didn't want. You can move your hinges at will, 
right? We had to do it with the door recently. You know, if you want the door to open differently, you can move the hinges. But that's not the way Wittgenstein's thinking about our hinge commitments. And I think actually a better metaphor that he uses for understanding the view is the riverbed. Um, you know, so what sometimes is part of the river, can be part of the riverbed, what's part of the riverbed, can be part of the river. This, I think, is, as this appears around about section 98, in, uh, so it's in the second notebook of um, Makes Up Uncertainty. And he, he references elsewhere as well. I think this is a more uh, interesting and more accurate from his perspective way of thinking about hinge commitments. It emphasizes the point that highly communal, you know, we're all sort of in the same river, as it were, um, that the, the transitions are slow and gradual. You know, that's another feature here. Um, and I think that's that's more in keeping with what he had in mind. The hinge metaphor implies a kind of, you know, just sort of move them around at will. That's not what he has in mind. Uh, it's more like, you know, we're part of a practice. We, you know, we're all communally flowing along within that practice. But within it, there's, there's room for change in terms of what kind of things are the, are the hard rock, as it were, and what is part of what's movable. I think there is an issue here, though, which I want to... Uh, concede as we'll see i i although i i think quasar fides and it's very plausible and should be taken seriously i do think there are live issues here um and i think one of the issues like that the people who have this concern are getting i think they're getting i don't know they formulate it quite right but i think what they're getting at is something right, correct is that um i you know standard ways of thinking about hinge epistemology and epistemic relativism as i've just mentioned they emphasize the shared nature of our, essentially shared nature of our hinge commitments. But that property doesn't follow over to the religious case. So if you apply hinge epistemology to the religious case, then it seems you have to admit of a, a class of hinge commitments that aren't widely shared. And indeed, they, the, the class that's not widely shared starts to look a little bit different to the ordinary. So we might say there's the quotidian hinges and the non-quotidian ones. Quotidian ones are ones that we tend to share, at least in the following sense. But even if you don't have them, you have them in, in a, you know, if you were me, you would have them as it were. And if I were you, I'd have yours. So for example, it's a hinge commitment for me that I'm speaking English. And let's say it's a hinge commitment for you that you're speaking Portuguese. But like, if you, if you were in my circumstances, you'd have, it's basically the same hinge commitment, right? If you were in my circumstances, you'd have the English one. And if I was in yours, I'd have the Portuguese one. Uh, and so, you know, my name is Duncan Pritchard. Well, you know, if you obviously have to insert a different name there, but it's basically the same hinge commitment. So a lot of, I think a lot of our hinge commitments are like that. They're, they're quotidian. They're just, they're, they're, they're commitments that we would all tend to have, at least in those circumstances. But the religious ones don't look like that. You know, we can imagine people in exactly the same circumstances I'm in right now, but they have different religious hinge commitments. And if that's right, then that is a, a disanalogy. And that at least might, even if it doesn't entail the, the damaging, disturbing form of epistemic relativism, it might make, it might make us more, more worried about it. I think there's another, this relates to another disanalogy that's in play here, um, which is, uh, so, so most of our, as I said before, most of our hinge commitments, they, they lie apart from the route traveled by uh, inquiry. They, um, this is that's Wittgenstein's phrase, we're not normally aware of our hinge commitments. They're, they're, they're hidden, as I say, they're hidden in plain view. It's not that anything is getting in the way of them. It's that the, the, the fact that they're so everyday and so mundane that makes them hard to, to recognize what they are. Cavell has written very nicely about this. I mean, drawing on Freud, Cavell has talked about the uncanny of the everyday, how when you do become, it's very hard to become aware of that which is most everyday. But when you do become aware of it, it, it feels odd. It looks odd and strange and uncanny, right? And I think that's what goes on with the hinge commitments. When you realize that they're there, it's very unsettling um, and the role they play. And, and, and this is odd because they, they, they're right in front of you, but you just can't see what's right in front of you precisely because it's right in front of you. So in a sense, they're kind of hidden. Now, religious hinge commitments, if they are hinge commitments, aren't like that. I mean, they are made explicit. I mean, we have creeds and things like that. Um, there's whole practices of scrutinizing them, you know, uh, the, yeah, there's there's uh, you know, services and there's uh, religious education and so on, ways in which people adjust that these commitments are justified and made explicit to the subject. And there's no counterpart to the quotidian case. You know, there's no, you know, there's no lesson in school that teaches you you've got hands or that teaches you you've never been to the moon, right? <laughs> there's no lesson. But there is a lesson in the religious case, right? There's a lesson to say, well, there's a God and this is how you relate to him and so on. 
So I think that is an interesting disanalogy. There's something different about it. That's why I say they're non-quotidian hinges. If you go down the quasi-fetistic route, then you have to admit that not all the hinges are quotidian. Some of them are non-quotidian in this sense. And then the final point I want to make here is about what I call honest doubt. So you, you might recognize that. So I don't know if you, you there's a famous poem by Tennyson. Uh, so Lord Tennyson, he, it's called In Memoriam. Um, it's, it's a wonderful poem. I, I encourage you to take a look at it. But he, he, this is phrase by honest doubt. He says that there is more, there lives, interesting, there lives, nice use of phrase, there lives more faith in honest doubt, believe me, than in half the creeds, he writes. And he's, he's making this point in response to this idea, which is attacking, that, that doubt is devil born. He wants to say doubt can be in the service of faith. And in fact, it can be a lived manifestation of faith. And that seems very right to me. Uh, I have Montaigne here on the, the PowerPoint. I mean, it seems like there's a certain way of thinking about a certain religious tradition, skeptical fideism, it's usually called, uh, which involves, involves, doubt is an essential part of it. And one worry you might have is, well, how do you accommodate that to quasi fideism? if you think that our basic religious convictions aren't in one sense amenable to doubt, right? Because they, they're not responsive to reasons. You know, doesn't that go against the sort of the phenomenology of religious conviction, at least, you know, in terms of our understanding of certain key historical figures like, you know, Montaigne, uh, one of my philosophical heroes, you know, that what, what he's doing is applying these doubts to everything that he's committed to, including his religious convictions. I think, though, if you look at the case of Montaigne, I've written about this. Um, skeptical fideism can be compatible with a kind of with quasi fideism. You can have skeptical quasi fideism. I mean, think about what's actually happening with Montaigne. He's using his, these peronian skeptical techniques, but he's using them as a way of 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 making explicit the sort of the the immovable points in his convictions, right? I mean. What does he discover when he subjects his religious conviction to these pronian techniques? Well, he discovers that, that this conviction is like breathing and as such needs no reasons. Um, you know, this is why, by the way, you know, Popkin uh, in his magisterial study of the history of skepticism, he, he describes um, Montaigne's apology for Raymond Sabon as the, the wonderful phrase, the womb of modern thought. Because Montaigne is making explicit how these Peronians, the, the, the way in which these Peronian skeptical techniques can be used and used in such a way to reveal basic commitments that are, are immune to rational evaluation. And I think that's what's going on in these cases. Uh, it's not that quasi fideism blocks that. Uh, you could combine quasi fideism with a kind of lived Peronism in the way Montaigne does, and it would be a way of exposing the kind of basic commitments. So, so one way of thinking about Montaigne is like kind of a, a it's an extension of the the, the the Peronians thought some things were immune to doubt, and you know, so, uh, you know, the, the, some things were subject to the, the Peronian techniques, and some things weren't. Some commitments. Montaigne exposes how that class of things that are of commitments that aren't that are immune to Peronian doubt is much broader than we thought. This includes religious claim. So we can make sense, I think, of how. Um, uh, how doubt can be a manifestation of faith, even on the quasi fideistic view. Okay, let me just uh, bring this to a conclusion then. Um, obviously, quasi fideism is only as plausible as the hinge epistemology that underpins, and I haven't defended that. A lot of the problems it faces are just versions of this, but uh, the problems that the, the general view uh, faces. But I think that there might be at least some good reasons uh, to to be cautious about being, if you're a hinge epistemologist, reasons to be cautious about applying it to the religious case, because it does bring with it, I think, that there are at least some disanalogies, as I've talked about. Um, you know, for example, that we're, we're typically aware of our religious hinge commitments in, in the way that we're not normally aware of them. Um, the, the fact that they're, as I've said, non-quotidian, uh, they don't seem to be the kind of commitments that everyone shares and so forth, or everyone would share in those conditions. Um, which exacerbates, as I said, the threat from epistemic relativism. And I think really what's going on here is that if you, if you, if you apply hinge epistemology to the religious case, you are extending the class of, of hinge commitments. And I think what you'd have to do if you're going to take this route is to, to imagine that there's a certain kind of hinge commitments, which are more like value claims or something like that. So you know, very different claims, like I've got two hands or whatever. So there may be political, ethical, religious claims, perhaps even aesthetic claims or something like that. 
and they're 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 known quotidian precisely because something about their axiological nature. But that's a, a topic for another day. And on that point, I'll close. Thank you. Oh, and I'll, I'll send the powerpoints round to everyone in the chat. Just give me a moment. I'll do that just now. So let me stop sharing the screen. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, very interesting talk. So there are questions first. I have a couple of questions, but I would like to hear you guys first. Um, so questions, if you have questions, you can write them in the chat and uh, you can tell me that you want and then uh, Jesse L can unmute you. Or if you want to write in the chat, you know. So I think I have to put the, uh, I think I have to put the PowerPoint into Dropbox in order to share it. Okay, let me do that. Right, that should work. Okay, I put them in a Dropbox file. So that's the, if anyone wants to see the PowerPoints with that. Okay, questions, anyone? Okay, I can start. Okay, first of all, Duncan, thanks a lot. Uh, can you hear me? Can you uh, all hear me? Can you hear me? Perfect, thank you. So, no, I have a couple of questions. First, uh, on uh, like on the project, of course, like today you're not defending the Hinge epistemology project in general, but you're just presenting the Hinge uh, project and, uh, you know, applied how it can be or it could be applied to, <clears throat> to religious, uh, religious belief. And, you know, I'm increasingly more sympathetic with, uh, yes, please raise a hand if you have a question and then, uh, okay, I'll go with the first question. So I was thinking like the parallel, <laughs> I haven't spoken English in public for like six years. So it's kind of, as you can remember, uh, I had an accent back then and I still keep having an accent now especially mixed with Italian and Portuguese at times. I don't even understand what I'm talking about, but I'll try to speak as slowly as possible. So I was thinking, uh, the, when it comes to hinges and the hinge commitments that we have, you know, I'm increasingly more sympathetic toward the Crispin Wright, Crispin Wright account, that the hinges, we need to take them because if not, not to take these hinges for granted, will lead uh, to a sort of uh, cognitive paralysis. So for instance, if we don't take for granted the fact that we have a body or that the external world exists, we will be unable to make any, uh, like any epistemic inquiry at all. I was wondering, this parallelism can work with uh, religious hinges because you know, from a side, if we don't believe in hinges, like you know the hinges that we have our body, that the world exists, we are pretty much in the impossibility of uh, pursuing any kind of inquiry at all. In the case of uh, hinges, religious hinges, this is not exactly the case. I mean, we can still not take for granted religious hinges, and uh, still, you know, we can have uh, yeah, we can push or inquiries. And so, I was wondering whether this parallelism. Uh, can work in the first place. And what do you think about this? First, whether it works in the Crispin right? And do you want to answer this question? On, uh, or the second one is more like you know, a general uh, worry that toward the, the Hinge epistemology project. At the end of the day, are you saying that both our uh, everyday hinges and our religious hinges, they are still irrational, no? like non-rational, not rational. Well, it does not lead to a sort of uh, human skepticism. Like uh, at the end of the day, we have to admit that all our inquiries, uh, every day, the religious one, they both uh, rest on an irrational uh, supposition. And if uh, this will not trade one skepticism with another, can you, so. Okay, yeah. No, they're great questions. On the first one, I mean, if you do go down the, the right, Crispin right line, then you, I think the, the application to quasi fideism isn't going to work precisely for the reason that you give. I think it's the wrong way to think about our hinge commitments, though. So I mentioned in the talk about how I think 
standard views domesticate Wittgenstein. I think this is like a, a really good example of how they domesticate him. So on this view, we're meant to think, I think, of hinge commitments as kind of like assumptions, like reasonable assumptions or reasonable hypotheses or something, or essentially reasonable because they're essential or something like that. I mean, it's true. They are required, right? That's, that's definitely true. But they don't thereby, I think Wittgenstein is quite clear, they don't thereby get a, a rational status. And if we think of them as assumptions or hypotheses, we, we completely misunderstand the role they, they play. It's not like, you know, it, it's, the, the commitment is already there. It's not like, and then, uh, so the, the idea of that we, 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 as it were, come to acquire such a commitment, or there's some rational process that we can go through, which would give the commitments that there some rational underpinning. I think Wittgenstein's wanted to, so part of the worry here is that people are right, I think, they just don't want to admit or take seriously this thought that it really is fundamentally an irrational commitment. And, and, and so that's why they try to find ways to make sense of how it could be rational otherwise. This relates to the second point, by the way, and I think part of what, why they don't want to do that is precisely because of your concern about this being skepticism in disguise. Uh, but I think it, the opposite's the case. You know, Wittgenstein, what he's trying to get us to see is that, you know, if we if we take seriously that there's this faulty picture in play, a faulty picture on which we can rationally evaluate our commitments on mass, then the, then a consequence of that is that the realization that aspiring to fully general rational evaluations, that's it. that's like aspiring for a circle square. You know, the mm -hmm. fact that we can't do it. Isn't, it reveals nothing about our cognitive limitations. You know? So, you know, Wright will say again, I mean, one of his themes in his work is, oh, we, we discover some cognitive limitations. But really, you know, is it, is it a limitation on my imaginative powers that I can't imagine a circle square? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> so that there is no, you know, in, in a sense, like the, this is why one thing I say about the hinges, in a sense, they're neither known nor unknown. I mean, technically they're unknown, they're not known. But in a sense, they're neither known or unknown because they're not in the, what we realize is they're not in the market for knowledge. They're not the kinds of things that can be known. Um, so I think that's a, that's a, you know, this is why I think it's the antidote to skepticism because, the, or a certain kind of skepticism anyway, because what you have to do is to reveal the, the faulty theoretical picture that's generating the problem and then get rid of it. And so if you don't, you know, if, if you don't go the, the whole hog, as it were, then, you know, you can't. Get your, get your way out of the fly doesn't get its way out of the fly bottle. One more thing to say about this is that I do think there is an anxiety that remains, which I called epistemic vertigo. Mm -hmm. I, I think this Cavell is very good on this. There is something, there is a kind of when we realize nothing is holding everything up, as it were. <laughs> you know, that 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 causes a certain kind of anxiety. I think what I've tried to do is try and explain how that anxiety is different from skepticism, right? There's a skeptical anxiety, that's the epistemic angst. We can deal with that. But there's this other kind of, there's like sort of residual anxiety that re remains, the epistemic vertigo. It's like this aspiration for something which we can never have. And um, yeah, and I think that's an in, a, a really interesting phenomenon, something that we need to, to, to deal with and understand. Uh, and I think it's a deeply existential feature of the, of the human, condi human condition, if you like, the, this recognition that, this, this, the, that we aspire to certain kinds of uh, epistemic groundings that are unavailable. Um, so I think there is a project of understanding what that is, but it's also, by the same token, it's a project of understanding why that's distinct from skepticism. Interesting. So if I understand, is uh, like the difference between uh, your approach and, and the human approach that for Hume, like uh, skepticism is impossible, is uh, rational, but unlivable, while in your case is unrational and unlivable. Jack. Well, like, the, the uh, problem with the human approach is that it concedes too much. Because it concedes the coherence of, of fully general rational evaluations. So it's already, it already buys into the picture. So it, it tells us that there's something that we could have that we lack. What Wittgenstein, I think, is trying to get us to see is that what, what's, being, what's being described as a possibility here simply isn't a possibility at all. Mm -hmm. And so it's really crucial to, to finding our way to getting the kind of intellectual quietude we get from, from resolving a skeptical problem is to realize that what we're responding to just simply isn't there. Mm -hmm. So it was the like the 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 thing that it was wrong in the first place. Let's say the attempt was. Thank you. Like it's not okay. Bye -bye. It's not a conversation with, in for, <laughs> between me and you, but there are also questions. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. So uh, I'm sure that we will go back to 
these questions. Okay. Nicola, so, Nicola, this is it. Could I ask a question to Professor Pritchard? Okay. Okay. Uh, Professor Pritchard, thank you for the, your excellent talk. I would like to know if you agree that underlying this discussion, we have in fact a consistent logic because we are dealing with contradictions. We have a special kind of implication and maybe we could use a concept we have studied and developed it here in our group, introduced it by Professor Newton da Costa, the concept of quasi-truth. I don't know if you are familiar to this kind of concepts. Yeah, no, I am. I am familiar. Um, uh, you know, JC Bill is a good friend of mine, so uh, you know, I talked to him about these issues and so on. I, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very old fashioned about, my, I like my logics classical and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or at least let me put it this way. Um, I think we can resolve the problem without needing logical revisionism of any kind. So if there are reasons to be logical revisionists, then I, th they, they will be independent reasons. Um, so, so in this case, for example, uh, you know, I, I don't think we, for quasi fideism, we, we don't need any revision of logic to make sense of the view and why it might work and so on. Um, so, but there, there may be domains where we want to have, you know, um, where we want to have dialectic truth and so forth, but uh, I'm not sure that here we, we need it to resolve the problem. Yeah, because for sure we are dealing with a, a, not, a non classical uh, implication a non-classical conditional operator. And we are dealing um, in a, a kind of reasoning in which the ex falso sequitur called liberty is not valid in general. And so it seems that we are, we need a very consistent underlying logic. Yeah, I, I need to see the details. I, I, I guess I'm not seeing why, why there'd be any problem with classical logic with, with quasi-fideism. I mean, it's, it's consistent with the view that, it, that there's no commitment to saying that the contradictions can be true. It, there might be commitments to saying that there are things that we, there are commitments to saying there are things that we don't have rational access to, uh, some things that are knowable, but not necessarily that they're not true, right? So, or even any claim about their, their truth, actually, I mean, that's a separate, would be a separate issue. It's, it's purely an epistemic thesis. Maybe Fabio Bertato could help us concerning the discussion um, um, we could try after okay thank, thank you, you. Uh, so, uh, probably uh, domingo sparia do you want to make a question or do you want to write it down okay I, may i okay thanks uh, Duncan, for your talk great talk amazing i have only a small question uh, a clarificatory question of how how do you how we are account deal with disagreement, because it is clear for me that uh, we we do not disagree about uh, having inch commitments about in having to 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 ends. For me, is <laughs> all agree with that yeah, yeah, yeah. having to ends. But concerning to re religious beliefs, we do not agree with the. With, with that, we do not have that kind of agreement. So, how your account deal with that uh, thing? Yeah, good. I mean, this is yeah. So this, I have a longer version of this talk where I, I talk about disagreement. Um, so it, this relates to the epistemic relativism point. Um, if you go, if you laugh at the non-Cartesian hinges, as I'm calling them, then that precisely this is one feature. You know, with the Cartesian hinges, because they're they're either widely shared, or at least the kind of thing that we we understand how our how the other person would have. You know, I suppose it's a hinge for you that you're speaking Portuguese, a hinge for me that, or it's a hinge for you. Your name is Domingos, and it's a hinge for me. My name is Duncan. Yeah. We, there's no disagreement about you know. You know, I think it, it wouldn't even make sense. You know, you you perfectly understand why I might be a hinge connected yeah. to to uh, with a different content there. So but, I think you're but, right. The, the, what happens when we get to the non-quotidian hinges? One consequence of that is that we we can make sense of disagreements of this kind. Now, is there though now a problem? Remember, I say with epistemic relativism, 
what makes it problematic is there has to be incommensurability. Yeah. So the issue comes down to, is there incommensurability when we have disagreements about uh, religious hinges in virtue of the fact they're hinges? Yeah. And one thing I've tried to argue is that that doesn't follow. Uh, I mean, disagreement is difficult, difficult to resolve, but it doesn't follow this in principle and possible. And the, the way I explain this in terms of um, uh, a side on versus straight on uh, uh, engagements, right? So, so what follows from the hinge view is that the, the nothing to be, there's nothing to be gained in dis disagreement, let's say, between atheists and atheists, which just involves them repeating articles of their, their faith or the lack of. Yeah. Like, so think of the new atheism movement that was very big a few years ago. I just think that was completely pointless. You have these debates between, you know, Lane Craig and Dawkins or what have you. What, it doesn't serve any purpose, it seems to me, in terms of resolving disagreements. But there are ways of resolving disagreements where there are fundamentally different hinge commitments. What they involve, it seems to me, is trying to change, change people's k up beliefs. Yeah. And this is why it's side on. So, you know, this is what this is how, for example, like, you know, take something that isn't religious, like, let's say, um, issues about creationism. Oh, so this is religious, but climate change or something like that. So, you know, where there are fundamental commitments that are different, I think the way you convince someone isn't just by simply reasserting your position. You have to, like, get to know them, you know, form a relationship with them. You appeal to lots of, you find common ground, you appeal to that common ground and so on. And what you're doing is over time, hopefully you're changing their k up beliefs. If you change enough of their k up beliefs, then what the Uber hinge manifests, how it manifests itself will be different hinge commitments. So I think this tells us something interesting about how we resolve those kinds of deep disagreements, like the religious case. That, and, I, and I think, you know, intelligent people understand this already. If you want to, you know, think of family members that have completely different points of view to you. You know, you don't you don't change their minds by yelling at them or, you know, re going over, like restating the creed or whatever. But yeah. you can change their minds by getting, you know, by forming a relationship with them. And over time, you know, coming to sort of common understandings of things and so on. And that's how that's how deep disagreements get resolved. So so I think this is actually an advantage of the view because it, it tells us it tells us what needs to happen to change. You know, what, why are deep disagreements so hard to resolve and what would it take to resolve them? Yeah. yeah, I see. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, uh, okay, we have another question from uh, Professor Agnaldo Portugal. Uh, Agnaldo, you want me to read? Or... Actually, I can see it in the chat. Shall I just... Unless oh, okay, I'll, but... Yeah, so, so um, uh, Agnaldo just me. points out that in the natural theology case, you know, natural mm -hmm. theologians... Um, uh, you know, what, what, what does this have to do with religious conviction in the first place? Is it a metaphysical debate, first of all? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. I mean, the, so this was an objection someone else made to me, right? The, the Derrida, uh, John Derrida said, you know, natural theology is, is a process of finding grounds for uh, religious conviction. So how do you make sense of that if you're a quasi fideus? But yes, I, 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 I the, what you're saying is, is suits me down to the ground. I think you're right. It, that isn't really what it's about at all. Uh, and if that's right, then the even less of a tension with quasi fideism You know, I, I just don't think it's true that natural theologians are trying, you know, that, as it were, it's provisional, their religious conviction, and then they go out and seek evidence to, to underpin it. That's not really, doesn't really describe what they're actually doing. Um, so, yeah, I would agree with you, Agnaldo, on that, that point. Okay, thank you. So, uh... Desiderio, Professor Desiderio Murcio. Hi, thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. I have uh, two worries, and uh, they uh, ultimately they come together, uh, and they both have to do with uh, uh, the dynamics of belief or quasi belief, or any uh, attitude that's uh, in the neighborhood of belief, uh, uh, even a commitment, and even a hinge commitment. What I mean by the dyna dynamics of it is that. Uh, if you uh, do not acknowledge that there's this feature of human cognition, which is, well, we put some things under our purview and not others, and we cannot put them all at the same time under our purview, but we can certainly take them one at a time and try to uh, see uh, which ones are fair better. So when we look at it like that, my main worry is that uh, hinge commitments is just a sort of a smokescreen 
for a very trivial aspect of our cognitive lives, which is just that and there are lots of things that are unsaid and are uh, opaque to, our, to us, and that's just it. And that's, that's nothing more uh, uh, substantial here to go about uh, epistemically. Now, this comes together uh, with my second worry, which is that perhaps something like that happens actually uh, with uh, religious belief. I mean, if you look at uh, the way Pascal, for instance, uh, uh, faced his own religious beliefs, he seems that he wasn't very interested at all in the sort of natural theology or any sort of empirical or historical proof. But that's just because he thought that all those proofs were not very good at all. And so he claims that, well, if there is a God, we uh, don't know what it is or even if he is. But then he goes on assuming that there is a God and that God uh, will send you to hell if you do not believe in God or something like that. So my, my second worry here is that uh, you mentioned that very briefly about, well, this is an empirical question, whether or not people who have religious beliefs, do they have them in the way Wittgenstein, uh, according to you, thought that they have religious beliefs. But my worry is more than just a, an empirical aside, is that uh, precisely because, well, one can be raised as a Muslim, say, and then suddenly or in time, the person can start worrying about the foundations of his beliefs and he may very well uh, uh, stop being a Muslim. And so these two worries come together to say, well, it doesn't change much of anything here because if I'm talking with a Muslim, I'm saying, well, okay, I, I, I accept that you have lots of different beliefs you and I and uh, perhaps it's very difficult for us to talk uh, about them but if you are civil enough and we are honest enough we can certainly try to bring them up and well perhaps you will find or I will find or you will find that we are wrong and so it doesn't it, the whole thing about a hinge commitment seems to be not not to be doing any real work here perhaps Okay, thank you. Yeah. So on the first point, um, the claim isn't really psychological. I mean, I'm sure you're right. There are psychological limitations, I'm sure, on how many thing commitments we can hold in abeyance at any time. Uh, I mean, Wittgenstein is quite clear that this is, made, as he says again and again, this is a logical point, right? So he's making a much stronger claim. I mean, this might be another difference between him and Hume, for example. I think Hume is talking about certain psychological limitations, uh, but um, Wittgenstein, it seems, is saying, no, no, it's, it's more than that. I mean, he's trying to get us to see that it's in the nature of what it is to be, to have rationality, to be in the, make moves in the space of reasons at all, that you have this certainty in play. So it's a much stronger claim. It's not the, um, it's not that, that I, I would take that to be as, again, a kind of like, that would like a domesticated version of the, the Wittgenstein in view. I think his, his actual view is much more uh, stronger. Um, on the second point, I'm not sure I was really following it. So, um, I mean, you know, so on the hinge view, yes, I mean, of course, your hinges can change. Um, I mean, as, as I, on my view, I think you can explain how they change. Uh, and indeed, they can even change quite quickly, uh, at least to the extent that there was a process of change which might have been hidden from view going on under the surface over time. But there could be like a sort of tipping point. Um, and I think that's probably what happens when you have, you know, religious conversions or, or, the, or the apostates and so forth. Um, so, you know, just as your chaotic beliefs can change over time and that can have effect on your, your hinges. So, you know, the chaotic beliefs relevant to religion. Yeah. I mean, and I think it often happens with, as I said in, to Domingos, you know, with personal relate. I mean, it's, I, I think it's very interesting that a lot of conversions go via personal relationships people have with others. Um, and anything to go the opposite way as well, you know, people have bad experiences and then that leads to... It's, uh, the, it's the way in which that can have quite dramatic effects on our chaotic beliefs, how we see the world. And then once that occurs, then that can change the hinge commitments. So I, I guess I would see it as a kind of a, an attraction of the view that it, it does have mechanisms in play to explain how that occurs. And indeed we have, you know, it's not a hinge commitment in, all, and in very abnormal circumstances that I've not got two hands and so on, uh, that I've got two hands and so forth. So, um, yeah, so if the worry was just that 
hinge commitments can change or we can, yeah, okay. Maybe I'm not getting the question, but I, I don't see that as a problem for the view. It seems like that's actually an advantage of the view that we can account for the mechanisms that explain how these deep commitments, you know, how can it be that, you know, for a certain kind of person, I mentioned Shuzaku Endo there, you know, one of his great books is uh, Silence. And I don't know if you know, it's a wonderful book. So you have these um, uh, Catholic priests in uh, in Japan and they're being tormented and, and, and God is silent. There's no no answer from God. And they can't, but it doesn't change in any sense, that conviction. You know, everything, how, how do we make sense of what's going on in this case? Their conviction is exactly the same, even though nothing now, everything they expected to occur isn't occurring. There's no, God is through, completely silent and there's still these terrible things occur, uh, happening. Um, but the conviction remains the same. How do we explain that? You know, Endo presents it in very, very vivid terms. I think very plausible terms is what, what a certain kind of religion, religious conviction would look like. Hard to make sense of it on standard views, it seems to me. But on the quasar fides view, you can you can make sense of it, right? That there's that we can make sense of how their practices could 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 support a certain kind of conviction like that. But equally, it also makes sense of how you know there'd be other kinds of conviction which could change over time in this gradual way. You know, someone has different kinds of experiences that changes their beliefs in some important way, and then that changes their their basic commitments. Yeah. So I don't know. I. I by all means, come back to me if you think I've misunderstood the question. But I, I, I guess I see this more of an advantage of the view rather than a, a disadvantage. Okay, may, may I then come to a little follow up? Then my my main worry is that we don't need uh, any sort of a uh, conception of inch commitment to explain what's going on in those cases. You just need to acknowledge that uh, people's cognitive abilities are dynamic, uh, beliefs and quasi beliefs are dynamic, and uh, 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 commitments are dy dynamic and that means that sometimes they come under our scrutiny and we analyze them and we accept them and sometimes we they just don't come under our scrutiny and we just don't know about them and sometimes they do come and we reject them uh, we realize well I was wrong so my that's my worry my worry is if you accept a full-blooded dynamic uh, a conception of the way uh, our uh, epistemic uh, uh, goings on going goes on. Uh, do you even need the concept of a, a, a hinge commitment? And uh, what you say that you can explain with the the concept of hinge commitment when it comes to religious conversion or religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, serenity, so to speak, in the face of uh, uh, non-evidence or even anti-evidence, uh, well, we can also explain that in the purely psychological terms. We can say, well, sometimes people are so, uh, they were raised in such a way that they have a, a very emotional difficulty to deal with uh, a new way of looking at life. And that's just a dynamic kind of thing. You don't need any special philosophical concept here. That's my word. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's interesting. I, okay, I understand the question more now. I mean, it seems to me, though, what's going on when one tries to offer those rich accounts is precisely appealing to distinctive functional roles that are playing by the mental state. So, so for example, so I'm of the view in epistemology that belief is kind of like a weasel term. I think this is true in philosophy. But it's, 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 it's ordinary usage is so broad and so many different kinds of propositional attitudes fall under it that it's, it's almost useless. Um, and that's why I think we need to differentiate different kinds of propositional attitudes. When we do, I think we realize that hinge commitments play a, a different role to lots of propositional attitudes that we're familiar with, like acceptances, like chaotic beliefs, like aliefs, like trustings, like hypotheses, like so on. Now, it strikes me that what you might be describing may well be the same kind of taxonomy, right? We need a richer taxonomy of what's going on. Um, when that Richard taxonomy is in play, I think we'll pick out particular kinds of propositional attitudes, which will be the hinge ones. So that everything then will, that will depend. So you say it's a purely psychological. Well, I mean, if, you're, if you believe in hinge commitments, well, of course, there's a psychological aspect to it, but it isn't just the psychological aspect. So, for example, there has to be a certain functional role. Um, I mean, on my view, for example, pathological certainty doesn't suffice for hinge commitments, you know, one can be pathologically certain something, but it, it doesn't have the right kind of relationship to the uber hinge, 
for it to be manifest of a of, of, of a, so I think once we start making those so this, we can both be engaged in the very same project of more narrow classifications of our propositional attitudes. Uh, but I would say that once the dust has settled and we've got this taxonomy in play, there will be a distinctive propositional attitude, which is the hinge one, which is which is playing some important explanatory role in that taxonomy. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So now it's time for Egemen. Uh, Egemen has a question. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, first of all, I thank you. It was really a good talk. I really enjoyed. Uh, my question is simple. I believe that it's simple. And it's, uh, it's about the term quasi itself, in fact, uh, because sometimes I believe that this term really make things more confusing in a certain sense. And in, uh, in the context of Wittgenstein, I believe, for example, we can equally use that very term quasi as in the case uh, Wittgenstein is doing quasi behaviorism, not quasi fideism, but quasi behaviorism, assuming that perhaps fideism is uh, concerned with inner criterion of truth while the behaviorism is concerned with the outer criterion of truth. And I, uh, I think further believe that Wittgenstein is skeptic about the inner criterion of truth, especially through his late writings. And in general, he is, I think, fine with outer criterions and the behaviors or something. Uh, so my question is, uh, does this make sense make sense to you? This, for example, we can equally use the word quasi for quasi behaviorism. So this maybe as a result show us that this quasi fideism is not accurate enough to uh, understand Wittgenstein's religious point of views. Yeah, thank you. I I, I don't think Wittgenstein is um, is endorsing behaviorism. We have to be careful though, because what he certainly does want to endorse is this thought that. Um, the certainty is manifest in our, it's primarily manifest in our actions. Um, so we're not to think of it. I mean, I, I mentioned at one point that we may never even have a current thoughts about our hinge commitment. So not, we don't have a current thoughts about ordinarily qua hinge commitments. So that we have them is something that's manifest in our behavior. But I don't think it follows from that, that he's offering a sort of behaviorist. He's not doing a reduction to behavior. Um, and indeed, so I'm, this might get us to sort of very technical issues, but on my view, I think one explanation of that is, as I just said when I was talking to Zed earlier, um, there's, there's a particular kind of um, relationship that has to be structural relationship that is required for, for a hinge commitment to be a hinge commitment. It has to have a certain relationship to the Uber hinge. Um, and I think that would, it would explain why... It, parallel kinds of behavior might not be hinge commitments. So you have two people behaving exactly the same way, but one manifesting a hinge, the other one isn't. Uh, because there's something, we what's required is something more than just that. So it's not that, I think what's right about what you say is that Wittgenstein is not offering some sort of intellectualist criteria for this. It's not as if, you know, uh, what differentiates the two is something about the sort of recurrent thoughts the subject has or something like that. But it's, it's more than just behavior. It's a certain kind of relationship, structural relationship, I think, that obtains. On the behavior point, by the way, Wittgenstein was very enamored with um, uh, this quotation from Goethe that in the, in the beginning was the deed, right? He wants to, but you know, in the beginning with the deed, it's not everything is the deed, right? It's just that that's the, the deed is the starting point. And I think very much so with, um, with the, the hinge commitments, you know, they're, they're manifest in our actions primarily rather than in, that in fact, actually, what we say, you know, our natural ways of describing the practices and so forth, our reflective descriptions of them are, are very unreliable, it turns out. I mean, this is, this is why philosophy gets us into problems. Uh, we have to attend very closely to what's actually taking place to realize that what we thought was a straightforward description of those practices turns out to be radically in error. Yeah, so he's not a behaviorist, I think.
Nicola, turn on your mic. We have time for uh, another couple of questions and then that's it. Okay, Duncan, can you read? There is a question by Edney Braga in the chat. Thank you for your oh, talk, yes, Professor. Yes, I can see, yeah. Okay, so uh, he said, uh, you, you mentioned the practice of some religious communities of questioning and analyzing their hinge commitments in creeds, religious education, etc. Given the typical hiddenness of hinge commitments, isn't it possible the existence of this practice undermines the accuracy of describing these religious commitments as such? Yes, so it is possible. I mean, this is what I was getting at when I was saying that there are certain important disanalogies between uh, a sort of core set of hinges and the religious hinges. In fact, Domingos in his question went back to this point, you know, how we, there aren't really disagreements about the, the quotidian hinges, as I call them, but there are disagreements about religious hinges. I think there are just, you know, insofar as we think of, um, as I mentioned at the end of the talk, if we think of certain axiological commitments as hinges, like, so you might think the religious case is one version of that. There's sort of ethical, political, maybe aesthetical commitments. Well, now it seems we have a class of hinges which are uh, ripe for disagreement, where which are disanalogous in certain ways to to the to the quotidian hinges. So what I was trying to do is flag that is there is a move here, right? Simply having hinge commit having hinge epistemology, I don't think obliges you to apply it to the religious case because there are sufficient disanalogies for you to 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 go except the former but not the latter. Um, but if you do take that route, then I think you have to embrace those disanalogies and then you have to find a way of accommodating them. And as I was suggesting, one way to accommodate them is to say, well, there's a, you, don't, you don't just want the religious hinges to be the only non-quotidian hinge. You want to say there's a whole class of non-quotidian hinges, presumably. Um, and that's why you might want to bring in political, ethical, aesthetical. That looks, seems like the obvious place to look at. But it's definitely an extension of the view. So... Uh, it's a decision point if you're a hinge epistemologist. Do you want to extend the view to the non quotidian hinges like the religious case? Thank you. Okay, last question, unfortunately. We, so you can see it in. Uh, oh, yes. So, okay. Yeah. Starling Reid. Starling Reid. Uh, do you think there might be a criteria by which to evaluate these sorts of hinge commitments? Uh, evaluate as in determine the value of, not simply adjudicate. Oh, okay. So like are some hinge commitments better than others or something like that? Um, of course, there's no criteria in which to epistemically evaluate them. I mean, you can epistemically evaluate them in the sense, but always relative to then other hinges, right? So, I mean, I, you know, I, can, I can rationally evaluate your hinges and you can rationally evaluate mine, but I can't, I can't do it to my own. Um, I don't know, beyond any other, is there a, and a criterion of evaluation that's, I mean, the hinges have to be true, right? So this might relate to this issue about the power consistency that, that cropped up. And I didn't talk about this, but it, you know, it seems to me that, you know, you, hinge commitments don't play any epistemic role unless they're true. Um, if they're not true, well then, you know, <laughs> we're, we're in a mess. But that, that's different from the skeptical problem, it seems to me. I mean, that's just a fact about the human condition. If our beliefs are radically in error, then epistemically we're, 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 we're in a mess, right? But that doesn't mean we're epistemically doomed, as it were. But the skeptical problem is, is, is troubling precisely because it says, look, even if you're not in those conditions, even if conditions are optimal, you're still epistemically doomed. That's a skeptical puzzle. And nothing like that is in the offing. Uh, but yes, they, they have to be true. So you, you can evaluate them as, in terms of whether or not they're true. Um, but um, yeah, so you can evaluate whether or not they're true. Obviously, that's a point against them if they're false. You can you can evaluate them epistemically, but not your own. Uh, any other criterion? Well, I guess maybe some are more useful than others. I don't know. Um, but of course, even if the, the problem with it coming up with any other criterion is that it's not like it's going to, on this view, it's not like it's going to play any role. It's not like, uh, you know, you could ground your conviction in these judgments. That's not the kind of conviction that it is, right? So, you know, I think questions about, you know, criterions of evaluation are probably buying into the very picture, which if you pursue a hinge, a hinge epistemology, you should reject. You know, a picture on which these are optional, you know, we can think of them as ordinary kinds of commitments that can be evaluated in the usual way. They're, they're not those kinds of commitments. Okay. Uh, então, 
I think we have time for uh, just another question, Professor Ricardo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your, your uh, talk. Congratulations. Uh, I have a general question. I, I would like to know if uh, is quasi-fideism a form of hash, uh, uh, rational justification for fat, uh, fit that asserts that we don't need rational justification for fat? Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Uh, is it a rational justification for why you don't need a rational justification? Yeah, is it? Okay, my brain is, is, is uh, that's a good question. My brain's a bit fried at the moment. Let me try and think. I mean, it's certainly, um, it's certainly an explanation of why no rational justification is is needed. So insofar as explanations are reason giving, then I guess it's a reason why you don't need re Yeah. Yeah, I think I, 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 I'm inclined to say yes, but, um, but I, I'm, I'm kind of nervous about saying yes in case it commits me to things. I, I, my sort of philosophical spidey senses tell me that there's a, there's a distinction that needs to come into play here. Something like explaining how it's there's there's kind of like it's a negative justification or something like that. So because um, often when you have sort of meta justifications, they they sort of cascade down into the thing into the, the object level, and obviously we're not going to get that here. And and it seems the story to be told is more a story of how it's like like the parity argument uh, that I mentioned. It's it's more a story about how. Um, in our practices of thinking that a, a justification was required here are problematic in some ways. And so, you know, we're making a negative point, it's not required. And the, it, be, it, it sort of deforms the status of that if we then think that that negative claim is itself a positive claim, but our, we are now justified in being unjustified or something like that. So yeah, I think um, I think there's some nuance required to state the view. But yes, it's an explanation, and explanations, broadly speaking, are reasons usually. So to that extent, even a negative explanation like this is negative reasons of a kind. Perfect. Okay, Duncan. Thanks again. Thank you very much uh, you know, for all the questions. It's been an interesting, an amazing presentation. Also, the discussion has been. Pretty interesting. Okay, so as you can see in the chat, uh, like we have a 30, 35 minutes break. Then uh, as some attendees uh, had problems with links, uh, you can use this link here for the second session that will start at 5 p.m. Uh, in, a, in a liberal way. So let's see in 30, 35 minutes, we'll be back here. Thanks again, Duncan, it's been a pleasure. Who knows Thanks one day we will see you here in person. You know, that would be lovely when this general mess will end, hopefully soon. Thanks a lot. And thanks, for thanks. thanks for having me, everyone. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. So, okay, everyone so might you open have, uh, the link right now and wait for the next session. Right, Fabio and Nicola. Right, just click yes. and I'll accept. The participants okay yes Great. thank you thank you so we we'll click on the vamos falar português <laughs> vamos aqui vamos usar essa eu não sei mais falar nenhum idioma vamos uh, clicar nesse outro link e pronto vamos lá the next link and that's it okay thank you very much Please help. Please stop the streaming.